know, the stuff that I talk about is more extreme and edge case. Um, my, my type of threats that I'm trying to protect against are, are not your, your sort of garden variety scammers, but if you at least understand how this information can get propagated and used against you, then perhaps you will be a bit more judicious in handing out your data all over the place. Unfortunately, you know, this takes work. Um, there are a variety of different levels uh, that you can end up at of how much effort you want to put into it. But I tell people the, the very, the simplest thing you can do is, um, not put out your real information if it's at all necessary. I would say like 95% of the forms you come across on the internet are asking you for things like telephone numbers and physical addresses and stuff that is not even necessary. Uh, they just want to collect that information perhaps because they can monetize it later. So like the vast majority of time, if you can't leave something blank and you absolutely have to fill out a form, you can put fake information in there. It's a, uh, not illegal to do that. Um, in many cases, it's not even illegal to give uh, pseudonyms, you know, fake names, um, unless you're signing a legal contract or unless you are actually engaged where your counterparty is some sort of government entity, then it's usually perfectly uh, legal for you to lie about your name and identity and, and whatnot. And you know that's sort of getting into the misinformation, disinformation type of thing. But like I said, if, if you're not giving your real information away, then it can't be used against you. So you know people will have to decide what their own threat level is, how paranoid they want to be. But I consider it to be like an insurance policy. And the example that I uh, usually give is, uh, for example, there was a, a woman, she was a social media manager and she was flying, I think, from New York to South Africa. And as she boarded the flight to South Africa, she posted uh, a somewhat racist tweet. It was you know, not in a very good taste, but she thought she was being funny. And then when she woke up 12 hours later, that one tweet had gone viral. And even though she only had like 200 followers, that one tweet had pissed off like 10 million people and had resulted in actual, you know, physical repercussions where people showed up at the airport uh, to watch her get off the plane. Other people started harassing her and her family and her employer. She ended up getting fired. And, and so the, the reason that I bring that up is just to show that there's this, um, there's an asymmetry today due to the information age where you can go from being a nobody to being a somebody that has the ire of tens of millions, if not billions of people directed at you overnight uh, because of you know a couple hundred characters that you put out onto the internet. Um, so that's why it's, it's so difficult, I think, to try to tell people what their threat uh, level should be because any of us who are on the internet, who are on social media, uh, who are putting information out there that could be potentially consumed by billions of people, uh, we are in a position where something like that could happen to us. And it is kind of a lottery thing. You know, I think the vast majority of people won't have that happen to them. So if you treat this as sort of a, an insurance policy, then I think the question really comes down to you know, how much effort do I want to put in to protecting myself from these various edge case risks? Hard to quantify, but uh, it can happen. And I was one of the unfortunate lottery winners. <laughs> Yeah, I guess one of the examples I, I, I can think of as well would be like the ledger breach, for example, where people just innocently buying a hardware wallet, nothing crazy. And then some of the repercussions of that have been pretty, pretty horrific, really, to be honest. I mean, with some of the threats and, and things that people have gotten. Um, so that's a kind of, I guess, an example for the everyday person, like, hey, it can happen and it can compromise quite a lot. Yeah, yeah. Nobody thinks about, oh, I'm buying something off the internet and getting it shipped to my house, and this is a threat. <laughs> you know, uh, it's it's a it's definitely a new paradigm that people are not used to, and um, 
this is this is just how it goes i think with technology making things much more convenient uh, the vast majority of people are just going to rush headlong into using whatever is placed before them without taking an adversarial perspective of well what could go wrong as someone who's put a lot of time and energy into becoming very knowledgeable about privacy and security what would you say is like the best takeaway for someone that's new to the topic I think that people can get overwhelmed, especially if they start digging into some of the things that I've posted, because most of what I talk about is the extreme edge case. Um, and like I said, it is, uh, it is a spectrum and you don't have to just dive into the deep end of going uh, extreme mountain ban off the grid type of thing where you're protecting yourself from absolutely everything um it's possible to just spend a few hours uh just trying to improve one small aspect of your privacy and see how that goes try to you know set up various things to automate protecting your privacy, you know, even, even just something as simple as installing a bunch of ad blockers in your browser will get you pretty far ahead uh, compared to a lot of other people. You know, that will at least help protect you from a lot of the surveillance uh, capitalism that happens just as you're doing your day-to-day -day web browsing. You know, going further to the extreme of trying to protect your home address is a lot trickier because then really for for any type of privacy you have to set up some sort of proxy or some sort of intermediary that essentially acts as a shield between you and your real information and the rest of the world and doing that type of stuff for internet uh type of proxies is simple you know if you want to protect you know your actual internet connection you can get a vpn set up and that doesn't take uh, a ton of work or you can you know set up new accounts new emails whatever you know we're just talking about a few clicks uh at that point but once it comes into the the world of uh the physical things that's when i would say the amount of effort and resources required really start to ramp up so you know if you want to protect your home uh, when it comes to getting things shipped to you, then you have to go get uh, a box somewhere else that's not in your home. And you know, that's going to cost you money anywhere from probably 50 to over $100 a month to start receiving packages on your behalf. Uh, even more if you set it up far away and it's remailing stuff to a, another address. But um, most of the time, um, I tell people, you know, check out the privacy resources on my website. You can start off with some beginner stuff and just keep chipping away at it at your own pace. Um, for me, I did dive into the deep end. I would say I basically burned down my entire life and started it over again, which was a very intensive uh, process, you know, both for my time and money and other resources. But you can learn from me doing it the hard way and figure out, you know, which pieces of uh, the puzzle would you like to attack? See how that goes. Um, if you get used to it and you're, you're feeling hungry to do even more, there's always more that you can do. Yeah, I suppose there's like a there's a trade off, isn't there, with privacy between like convenience and privacy? Like, and obviously, there's a scale which I'm sure many people would kind of want to be really private, but not kind of take those last steps to you know completely destroy any kind of convenience, I guess, in their lives. And other people may want to go the full way or whatever it may be. Um, I guess it's a personal personal preference and decision. Something, and you mentioned uh, the different resources that you have online that you've made. And uh, one of them, for example, Bitcoin page was something that I was given when I first got into Bitcoin. Um, and it was like, you know, huge part of helping me learn about it basically and setting me off on the right path. Um, so I'm ever appreciative of, of that. Um, but I guess um, something that I'd be interested to, to know um, it is kind of like uh, when it comes to Bitcoin, um, when you discovered Bitcoin, what was it? Um, what were the things I think, I guess, that kind of made you interested in it or excited about it per se? Um, so rather than just like the story of, you know, 
how you found it. What is it that actually kind of gravitated towards you about Bitcoin and kind of made you think, okay, well, this is, you know, important or interesting. And then maybe even made you think, okay, well, I'm then going to step into this as like almost a career opportunity. Like what, what was, what were the things that kind of went through your head at that time? Well, I was a computer scientist, so obviously the technology was intriguing to me. I had never thought about these problems before. And once I read the white paper, I realized that the solution was rather elegant. Um, it was kind of backwards of how you would probably try to attack a problem like that. And and that's you know why it was, I think, uh, so so much of a, a leap forward is because it turned a lot of things on their head. And um, I actually ended up giving a whole talk about this a few years ago, where I basically was making the argument that the, the type of system that Satoshi Nakamoto created, it's basically a bureaucratic system except it's an inverted bureaucracy where instead of being this top-down hierarchy, it's actually a bottom-up type of uh, organic uh, consensus process. And you know that's what uh, I think a lot of people misunderstood during the scaling wars, like trying to understand how governance in this type of system works. But at the time, I wasn't I wasn't thinking about governance really at all. Um, other than the technology, the thing that was just most intriguing to me was thinking of money as an open source project. And the reason that I found that intriguing was that you know money is a concept that does not, or at least should not belong to anyone in particular. It is this collective agreement upon everyone who's using the money. So it makes sense to me that anyone who wants to should be able to uh, essentially chip in and voice their opinion about what they believe money should actually be. What should the attributes of a sound monetary system be? Um, if you want to contribute to working towards improving a monetary system, then I don't think anyone should be able to shut you out from that. 